One morning, when Gregor Samsa woke from troubled dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a horrible vermin. He lay on his armor-like back, and if he lifted his little head, he could see his brown belly, slightly domed and divided by arches into stiff sections. The bedding was hardly able to cover it, and seemed ready to slide off at any moment. His many legs, pitifully thin compared with the size of the rest of him, waved about helplessly as he looked. What's happened to me? He thought. It wasn't a dream. His room, a proper human room, although a little too small, lay peacefully between its four familiar walls. A collection of textile samples lay spread out on the table. Samsa was a traveling salesman, and above it there hung a picture that he had recently cut out of an illustrated magazine and housed in a nice, gilded frame. It showed a lady fitted out with a fur hat and a fur bow who sat upright, raising a heavy fur muff that covered the whole of her lower arm towards the viewer. Gregor then turned to look out of the window at the dull weather. Drops of rain could be heard hitting the pane, which made him feel quite sad. How about if I sleep a bit longer and forget all this nonsense, he thought. But that was something he was unable to do because he was used to sleeping on his right and in his present state couldn't get into that position. However hard he threw himself onto his right, he always rolled back to where he was. He must have tried it a hundred times, shut his eyes so that he wouldn't have to look at his floundering legs, and only stopped when he began to feel a mild, dull pain there that he had not felt before. Oh God, he thought, what a strenuous career it is that I've chosen. Traveling, day in, day out, doing business like this takes much more effort than doing your own business at home. And on top of that, there's the curse of traveling, worries about making train connections, bad and irregular food, contact with different people all the time so that you can never get to know anyone or become friendly with them. It can all go to hell. He felt a slight itch up on his belly, pushed himself slowly up on his back towards the headboard so that he could lift his head better, found where the itch was, and saw that it was covered with lots of little white spots which he couldn't know what to make of. And when he tried to feel the place with one of his legs, he drew it quickly back, because as soon as he touched it, he was overcome by a cold shudder. He slid back into his former position. Getting up early all the time, he thought, it makes you stupid. You've got to get enough sleep. Other traveling salesmen live a life of luxury. For instance, whenever I go back to the guest house during the morning to copy out the contract, these gentlemen are always still sitting there eating their breakfast. I ought to just try it out with my boss. I'd get kicked out on the spot. But who knows? Maybe that would be the best thing for me. If I didn't have my parents to think about, I'd have given in my notice a long time ago. I'd have gone up to the boss and told him just what I think. Tell him everything. I would just let him know how I feel. He'd fall right off his desk. And it's a funny sort of business to be sitting up there at your desk, talking down at your subordinates from up there. Especially when you have to go right up close because the boss is hard of hearing. Well, there's still some hope. Once I've got the money together to pay off my parents' debt to him, another five or six years, I suppose. That's definitely what I'll do. That's when I'll make the big change. First of all, though, I've got to get up. My train leaves at five. As he looked over at the alarm clock ticking on his chest of drawers, God in heaven, he thought. It was half past six, and the hands were quietly moving forwards. It was even later than half past, more like quarter to seven. Had the alarm clock not rung? He could see it from the bed that it had been set for four o'clock as it should have been. It certainly must have rung. Yes, but was it possible to quietly sleep through that furniture rattling noise? True. He had not slept peacefully, but probably all the more deeply because of that. What should he do now? The next train went at seven. If he were to catch that, he would have to rush like mad and the collection of samples was still not packed and he did not at all feel particularly fresh and lively. And even if he did catch the train, he would not avoid his boss's anger, as the office assistant would have been there to see the five o'clock train go. He would have put in his report about Gregor not being there on time a long time ago. The office assistant was the boss's man, spineless, and with no understanding. 
what about if he reported sick? But that would be extremely strained and suspicious, as in 15 years of service, Gregor had never once yet been ill. His boss would certainly come around with a doctor from the medical insurance company, accuse his parents of having a lazy son, and accept the doctor's recommendation not to make any claim as the doctor believed that no one was ever ill, but many were work shy. And what's more, would he have been entirely wrong in this case? Gregor did in fact, apart from excessive sleepiness after sleeping for so long, feel completely well and even felt much hungrier than usual. He was still hurriedly thinking all this through, unable to decide to get out of bed, when the clock struck quarter to seven. There was a cautious knock at the door, near his head. Gregor. Somebody called. It was his mother. It's quarter to seven. Didn't you want to go somewhere? That gentle voice. Gregor was shocked when he heard his own voice answering it. It could hardly be recognized as the voice he had had before. As if from deep inside of him, there was a painful and uncontrollable squeaking mixed in with it. The words could be made out at first, but then there was a sort of echo which made him unclear, leaving the hearer unsure whether he had heard properly or not. Gregor had wanted to give a full answer and explain everything, but in the circumstances contented himself with saying, Yes, mother, yes, thank you, I'm getting up now. The change in Gregor's voice probably could not be noticed outside of the wooden door, as his mother was satisfied with this explanation and shuffled away. But this short conversation made the other members of the family aware that Gregor, against their expectations, was still at home, and soon his father came knocking at one of the side doors, gently, but with his fist. Gregor, he called. What's wrong? And after a short while, he called again with a warning deepness in his voice. Gregor. At the other side of the door, his sister came plaintively. Gregor? Aren't you well? Do you need anything? Gregor answered to both sides. I am ready now. Making an effort to remove all the strangeness from his voice by enunciating very carefully and putting long pauses between each individual word. His father went back to his breakfast. But his sister whispered, Gregor, Gregor, open the door, I beg of you. Gregor, however, had no thought of opening the door, and instead congratulated himself for his cautious habit, acquired from his traveling, of locking all doors at night, even when he was at home. The first thing he wanted to do was to get up in peace without being disturbed, to get dressed, and most of all, to have his breakfast. Only then would he consider what to do next, as he was well aware that he would not bring his thoughts to any sensible conclusions by lying in bed. He remembered that he had often felt a slight pain in bed, perhaps caused by lying awkwardly, but that had always turned out to be pure imagination, and he wondered how his imaginings would slowly resolve themselves today. He did not have the slightest doubt that the change in his voice was nothing more than the first sign of a serious cold, which was an occupational hazard for traveling salesmen. It was a simple matter to throw off the covers. He only had to blow himself up a little, and they would fall off themselves. But it became difficult after that, especially as he was so exceptionally broad. He would have used his arms and his hands to push himself up, but instead of them, he had only all those little legs continuously moving in different directions, and which he was moreover unable to control. If he wanted to bend one of them, then that was the first one that would stretch itself out, and if he finally managed to do what he wanted to do with that leg, all the others seemed to be set free and would move about painfully. This is something that can't be done in bed, Gregor said to himself. So don't keep trying to do it. The first thing he wanted to do was to get the lower part of his body out of the bed, but he had never seen this lower part, and could not imagine what it looked like. It turned out to be too hard to move. It went so slowly. And finally, almost in a frenzy, when he carelessly shoved himself forwards with all the force he could gather, he chose the wrong directions, hit hard against the lowest bedpost, and learned from the burning pain he felt that the lower part of his body might as well, at present, be the most sensitive. So then he tried to get the top part of his body out of the bed first, carefully turning his head to the side. This he managed quite easily, and despite its breath and its weight, the bulk of his body eventually followed slowly in the direction of the head. 
But when he had at last got his head out of the bed and into the fresh air, it occurred to him that if he let himself fall, it would be a miracle if his head was not injured. So he became afraid to carry on pushing himself forward in the same way. And he could not knock himself out now at any price. Better to stay in bed than lose consciousness. It took just as much effort to get back to where he had been earlier. But when he lay there, sighing, and was once more watching his legs as they struggled against each other harder than before, if that was possible, he could think of no way of bringing peace and order to his chaos. He told himself once more that it was not possible for him to stay in bed and that the most sensible thing to do was to get free of it whatever way he could at whatever sacrifice. At the same time though, he did not forget to remind himself that calm consideration was much better than rushing to desperate conclusions. At times like this, he would direct his eyes to the window and look out as clearly as he could. But unfortunately, even the other side of the narrow street was enveloped in morning fog that the view had little confidence or cheer to offer him. Seven o'clock already, he said to himself when the clock struck again. Seven o'clock and there is still a fog like this. And he lay there quietly a while longer, breathing lightly as if he perhaps expected the total stillness to bring things back to their real and natural state. And then he said to himself, before it strikes quarter to seven, I'll definitely have to get properly out of this bed. And by then, somebody would have come around to work to ask what's happened to me as well, as they open up at work before seven o'clock. And so he set himself to the task of swinging the entire length of his body out of bed all at the same time. If he succeeded in falling out of bed this way, he could probably avoid injuring his head. His back seemed to be quite hard, and probably nothing would happen to it falling onto the carpet. His main concern was for the loud noise he was bound to make, and which even through all the doors would probably raise concern if not alarm. But it was something that had to be risked. When Gregor was already sticking halfway out of the bed, the new method was more a game than an effort. All he had to do was rock back and forth. It occurred to him how simple everything would be if somebody came to help him. Two strong people, he had his father and the maid in mind, would have been more than enough. They would only have to push their arms under the dome on his back, peel him away from the bed, bend down with the load, and then be patient and careful as he swang onto the floor, where, hopefully, the little legs would find a use. Should he really call for help though, even apart from the fact that the doors were locked? Despite all the difficulty he was in, he could not suppress a smile at this thought. After a while, he had already moved so far across that it would have been hard for him to keep his balance if he rocked too hard. The time was now ten past seven, and he would have to make the final decision very soon. Then there was a ring at the door of the flat. That'll be someone from work, he said to himself, and froze very still, although his little legs only became all the more lively as they danced around. For a moment, everything remained quiet. They're not opening the door. Gregor said to himself, caught in some nonsensical hope. But then, of course, the maid's firm steps went to the door as ever and opened it. Gregor only needed to hear the visitor's first words of greeting and he knew who it was. The chief clerk himself. Why did Gregor have to be the only one condemned to work for a company where they immediately became highly suspicious at the slightest shortcoming? Were all the employees, every one of them, louts? Was there not one of them who was faithful and devoted, who would go so mad with pangs of conscience that he couldn't get out of bed if he didn't spend at least a couple of hours in the morning on company business? Was it really not enough to let one of the trainees make inquiries, assuming inquiries were even necessary? Did the chief clerk have to come himself, and did they have to show the whole innocent family that this was so suspicious that only the chief clerk could be trusted to have wisdom to investigate it? And more because these thoughts had made him upset, then, through any proper decision, he swung himself with all his force out of the bed. There was a loud thump, but it wasn't really a loud noise. His fall was softened a little by the carpet, and Gregor's back was also more elastic than he had thought, which made the sound muffled and not too noticeable. He had not held his head carefully enough, though, and hit it as he fell. Annoyed and in pain, he turned it and rubbed it against the carpet. Something's fallen down there said the chief clerk in the room on the left. Gregor tried to imagine whether something of the sort that had happened to him today could ever happen to the chief clerk too. You had to concede that it was possible. 
But as if in gruff reply to this question, the chief clerk's firm footsteps and his highly polished boots could now be heard in an adjoining room. From the room on his right, Gregor's sister whispered to him to let him know. Gregor, the chief clerk is here. Yes, I know, said Gregor to himself, but without daring to raise his voice loud enough for his sister to hear him. Gregor, said his father now from the room to his left. The chief clerk has come around and wants to know why you didn't leave on the early train. We don't know what to say to him. And anyway, he wants to speak to you personally. So please, open up this door. I'm sure he'll be good enough to forgive the untidiness of your room. Then the chief clerk called. Good morning, Mr. Samsa. He isn't well, said his mother to the chief clerk, while his father continued to speak through the door. He isn't well, please believe me. Why else would Gregor have missed the train? The lad only ever thinks about the business. It nearly makes me cross the way he never goes out in the evenings. He's been in town for a week now, but stayed home every evening. He sits with us in the kitchen, reads the paper, or studies the train timetables. His idea of relaxation is working with his fret saw. He's made a little frame, for instance. It only took him two or three evenings. You'll be amazed how nice it is. It's hanging up in his room. You'll see it as soon as Gregor opens the door. Anyway, I'm glad you're here. We wouldn't have been able to get Gregor to open a door by ourselves. He's so stubborn, and I'm sure he isn't well. Well, he said this morning that he is, but he isn't. I'll be there in a moment, said Gregor, slowly and thoughtfully, but without moving, so he would not miss any word of the conversation. Well, I can't think of any other way of explaining it, Miss Samsa, said the chief clerk. I hope it's nothing serious, but on the other hand, I must say that if we people in commerce ever become slightly unwell, then, fortunately, or unfortunately, if you like, we simply have to overcome it because of the business considerations. Can the chief clerk come in to see you now, then? Asked his father impatiently, knocking at the door again. No, said Gregor. In the room on his right, there followed a painful silence. In the room on his left, his sister began to cry. So why did his sister not go and join the others? She had probably only just got up and had not even begun to get dressed. And why was she crying? Was it because he had not got up and had not let the chief clerk in? Because he was in danger of losing his job and if that happened, his boss would once more pursue their parents with the same demands as before? There was no need to worry about things like that yet. Gregor was still there and had not the slightest intention of abandoning his family. For the time being, he just lay there on the carpet. And no one who knew the condition he was in would seriously have expected him to let the chief clerk in. It was only a minor discourtesy, and a suitable excuse could be easily found for it later on. It was not something for which Gregor could be sacked on the spot. And it seemed to Gregor much more sensible to leave him now in peace, instead of disturbing him with talking at him and crying. But the others didn't know what was happening. They were worried. That would excuse their behavior. The chief clerk now raised his voice. Mr. Samsa, he called to him. What is wrong? You barricade yourself in your room. Give us no more than a yes or no for an answer. You are causing serious and unnecessary concern to your parents, and you fail, and I mention this just by the way, you fail to carry out your business duties in a way that is quite unheard of. I'm speaking here on behalf of your parents and of your employer, and really must request a clear and immediate explanation. I'm astonished, quite astonished. I thought I knew you as a calm and sensible person, and now you suddenly seem to be showing off with peculiar whims. This morning, your employer did suggest a possible reason for your failure to appear. It's true. It had to do with the money that was recently entrusted to you. But I came near to giving him my word of honor. That could not have been the right explanation. But now, I see your incomprehensible stubbornness, and I no longer feel any wish whatsoever to intercede on your behalf. And nor is your position all that secure. I had originally intended to say all this to you in private, but since you caused me to waste my time here for no good reason, I don't see why your parents should not also learn of it. Your turnover has been very unsatisfactory of late. I grant you that it's not the time of year to do especially good business, we recognize that. But there is simply no time of the year to do no business at all, Mr. Samsa. We cannot allow there to be. But sir, called Gregor, beside himself and forgetting all else in the excitement, I'll open up immediately, just a moment. I'm slightly unwell, an attack of dizziness. I haven't been able to get up. I'm still in bed now, I'm quite fresh again now though. I'm just getting out of bed. 
Just a moment, be patient. It's not quite as easy as I'd thought. I'm quite alright now, though. It's shocking what can suddenly happen to a person. I was quite alright last night. My parents know about it, perhaps better than me. I had a small symptom of it last night already. They must have noticed it. I don't know why I didn't let you know at work. But you always think you can get over an illness without staying at home. Please don't make my parents suffer. There is no basis for any of the accusations you're making. Nobody's ever said a word to me about any of these things. Maybe you haven't read the latest contracts I sent in. I'll be right off with the 8 o'clock train as well. These few hours of rest may have given me strength. You don't need to wait, sir. I'll be in the office soon after you. And please be so good as to tell that to the boss and recommend me to him. And while Gregor gushed out these words, hardly knowing what he was saying, he made his way over to the chest of drawers. This was easily done, probably because of the practice he had already had in bed, where he now tried to get himself upright. He really did not want to open a door, really did not want to let them see him and to speak with the chief clerk. The others were being so insistent, and he was curious to learn what they would say when they caught the sight of him. If they were shocked, then it would no longer be Gregor's responsibility and he could rest. If, however, they took everything calmly, he would really have no reason to be upset. And if he hurried, he really could be at the station for 8 o'clock. The first few times he tried to climb up on the smooth chest of drawers, he slid down again. But he finally gave himself one last swing and stood there upright. The lowest part of his body was in serious pain, but he no longer gave any attention to it. Now, he let himself fall against the back of a nearby chair and held tightly to the edges of it with his little legs. By now, he had also calmed down and kept quiet so that he could listen to what the chief clerk was saying. Did you understand a word of all that? The chief clerk asked his parents. Surely he's not trying to make fools of us. Oh God, called his mother, who was already in tears. He could be seriously ill and we're making him suffer. Grete, Grete, she then cried. Mother? His sister came from the other side. They communicated across Gregor's room. You'll have to go get the doctor right away. Gregor is ill. Quick, get the doctor. Did you hear the way Gregor spoke just now? That was the voice of an animal, said the chief clerk, with a calmness that was in contrast with his mother's screams. Anna, Anna. His father called into the kitchen through the entrance hall, clapping his hands. Get a locksmith here, now. And the two girls, their skirts swishing, immediately ran out through the hall, retching open the front door of the flat as they went. How had his sister managed to get dressed so quickly? There was no sound of the door banging shut again. They must have left it open. People often do in homes where something awful has happened. Gregor, in contrast, had become much calmer. So they couldn't understand his words anymore. Although they seemed clear enough to him, clearer than before, perhaps his ears had become used to the sound. They had realized, though, that there was something wrong with him and were ready to help. The first response to the situation had been confident and wise, and that made him feel better. He felt that he had drawn back in among people, and from the doctor and the locksmith he expected great and surprising achievements, although he did not really distinguish one from the other. Whatever was said next would be crucial, so in order to make his voice as clear as possible, he coughed a little, but taking care to do this not too loudly, as even this might well sound different from the way a human coughs, and he was no longer sure he would judge this for himself. Meanwhile, it had become very quiet in the next room. Perhaps his parents were sat at the table whispering with the chief clerk, or perhaps they were all pressed against the door and listening. Gregor slowly pushed his way to the door with the chair. Once there, he let go of it and threw himself onto the door, holding himself upright against it using the adhesive on the tips of his legs. He rested there a little while to recover from the effort involved and then set himself to the task of turning the key in the lock with his mouth. He seemed, unfortunately, to have no proper teeth. How was he then to grasp the key? But the lack of teeth was, of course, made up for with a very strong jaw. Using the jaw, he really was able to start the key turning ignoring the fact that he must have been causing some kind of damage as brown liquid came from his mouth, flowed over the key and dripped onto the floor. Listen, said the chief clerk in the next room. He's turning the key. Gregor was greatly encouraged by this, but they all should have been calling on him, his father and his mother too, 
Well done, Gregor, they should have cried. Keep at it. Keep hold of the lock. And with the idea that they were all excitedly following his efforts, he bit into the key with all his strength, paying no attention to the pain he was causing himself. As the key turned round, he turned around the lock with it, only holding himself upright with his mouth, and hung on to the key, or pushed it down again with the whole weight of his body as needed. The clear sound of the lock as it snapped back was Gregor's sign that he could break his concentration. And as he regained his breath, he said to himself, so I didn't need a locksmith at all. Then he lay his head on the handle of the door and opened it completely. Because he had to open a door this way, it was already wide open before he could be seen. He had first to slowly turn himself around one of the double doors, and he was to do this very carefully if he did not want to fall flat on his back before entering the room. He was still occupied with this difficult movement, unable to pay attention to anything else, when he heard the chief clerk exclaim loudly, Oh, which sounded like the sowing of wind. Now he also saw him. He was the nearest to the door, his hand pressed against his mouth and slowly retreating as if driven by a steady and invisible force. Gregor's mother, her hair still disheveled from bed despite the cheap clerks being there, looked at his father. Then she unfolded her arms, took two steps forward towards Gregor, and sank down onto the floor into her skirts that spread themselves out around her as her head disappeared down onto her breast. His father looked hostile and clenched his fists as if wanting to knock Gregor back into the room. Then he looked uncertainly around the living room, covered his eyes with his hands, and wept so that his powerful chest shook. So Gregor did not go into the room but leant against the inside of the other door, which was still held bolted in place. In this way, only half his body could be seen, along with his head above it, which he leant over to one side as he peered out at the others. Meanwhile, the day had become much brighter. Part of the endless, grey-black building on the other side of the street, which was a hospital, could be seen quite clearly, with an austere and regular line of windows piercing its facade. The rain was still falling now throwing down large individual droplets which hit the ground one at a time. The washing up from breakfast lay on the table. There was so much of it because, for Gregor's father, breakfast was the most important meal of the day and he would stretch it out for several hours as he sat reading a number of different newspapers. On the wall, exactly opposite, there was a photograph of Gregor when he was a lieutenant in the army, his sword in his hand and a carefree smile on his face as he called forth respect for his uniform and bearing. The door to the entrance hall was open, and as the front door of the flat was also open, he could see onto the landing and the stairs where they began their way down below. Now then, said Gregor, well aware that he was the only one who had kept calm. I'll get dressed straight away now, pack up my samples and set off. Will you please just let me leave? You can see, he said to the chief clerk, that I'm not stubborn and I like to do my job. Being a commercial traveler is arduous, but without traveling, I couldn't earn my living. So, where are you going? Into the office? Yes? <laughs> Will you report everything accurately then? It's quite possible for someone to be temporarily unable to work, but that's just the right time to remember what's been achieved in the past and consider that later on, once the difficulty has been removed, he will certainly work with all the more diligence and concentration. You're well aware that I'm seriously in debt to our employer, as well as having to look after my parents and my sister, so that I'm trapped in a difficult situation. But I will work my way out of it again. Please don't make things any harder for me than they are already, and don't take sides against me at the office. I know that nobody likes the travelers. They think we earn an enormous wage as well as having a soft time of it. That's just prejudice. But they have no particular reason to think it better. But you, sir you have a better overview than the rest of the staff. In fact, if I can say this in confidence, a better overview than the boss himself. It's very easy for a businessman like him to make mistakes about his employees and judge them even more harshly than he should. And you're also well aware that we travelers spent almost a whole year away from the office so that we can very easily fall victim to gossip and chance and groundless complaints. And it's almost impossible to defend yourself from that sort of thing. We don't usually even hear about them, or if at all, it's when we arrive back home exhausted from a trip, and that's when we feel the harmful effects of what's been going on without even knowing what caused them. Please, don't go away. At least first say something to show that you grant that I'm at least partly right. But a chief clerk had turned away as soon as Gregor had started to speak, 
and, with protruding lips, only stared back at him over his trembling shoulders as he left. He did not keep still for a moment while Gregor was speaking, but moved steadily towards the door without taking his eyes off of him. He moved very gradually, as if there had been some secret prohibition on leaving the room. It was only when he had reached the entrance hall that he made a sudden movement, drew his foot from the living room, and rushed forward in a panic. In the hall, he stretched his right hand out towards the stairway, as if out there, there was some supernatural force waiting to save him. Gregor realized that it was out of the question to let the chief clerk go away in this mood if his position in the firm was not to be put into extreme danger. That was something his parents did not understand very well. Over the years, they had become convinced that his job would provide for Gregor for his entire life. And besides, they had so much to worry about at present that they had lost any sight of any thought for the future. Gregor, though, did think about the future. The chief clerk had to be held back, calmed down, convinced, and finally won over. The future of Gregor and his family depended on it. If only his sister was here. She was clever. She was already in tears while Gregor was still lying peacefully on his back. And a chief clerk was a lover of women. Surely she could persuade him. She would close the front door in the entrance hall and talk him out of a shocked state. But his sister was not there. Gregor would have to do the job himself. And without considering that he still was not familiar with how well he could move about in his present state, or that his speech still might not, or probably would not, be understood, he let go of the door, pushed himself through the opening, tried to reach the chief clerk on the landing who, ridiculously, was holding onto the banister with both hands, but Gregor fell immediately over and, with a little scream as he sought something to hold on to, landed on his numerous little legs. Hardly had that happened than, for the first time of the day, he began to feel all right in his body. Little legs had the solid ground under them. To his pleasure, they did exactly as he told them. They were even making an effort to carry him where he wanted to go. And he was soon believing that all his sorrows would soon be finally at an end. He held back the urge to move, but swayed from side to side as he crouched there on the floor. His mother was not far in front of him, and seemed, at first, quite engrossed in herself. But then she suddenly jumped up with her arms outstretched and her fingers spread shouting, Help! For pity's sake, help! The way she held her head suggested she wanted to see Gregor better. But the unthinking way she was hurrying backward showed that she did not. She had forgotten that the table was behind her with all the breakfast things on it. When she reached the table, she sat quickly down on it without knowing what she was doing. Without even seeming to notice that the coffee pot had been knocked over and a gush of coffee was pouring down onto the carpet. Mother, mother, said Gregor gently, looking up at her. He had completely forgotten the chief clerk for the moment, but he could not help himself snapping at the air with his jaws at the sight of the flow of coffee. That set his mother screaming anew. She fled from the table and into the arms of his father as he rushed towards her. Gregor, though, had no time to spare for his parents now. The chief clerk had already reached the stairs. With his chin on the banister, he looked back for the last time. Gregor made a run for him. He wanted to be sure of reaching him. The chief clerk must have expected something, as he leapt down several steps at once and disappeared, his shouts resounding all the way down the staircase. The flight of the chief clerk seemed, unfortunately, to put Gregor's father into a panic as well. Until then, he had been relatively self-controlled, but now, instead of running after chief clerk himself, or at least not impeding Gregor as he ran after him, Gregor's father seized the chief clerk's stick in his right hand, the chief clerk had left it behind a chair, along with his hat and overcoat, picked up a large newspaper from the table with his left and used them to drive Gregor back into his room, stamping his foot at him as he went. Gregor's appeals to his father were of no help. His appeals were simply not understood. However much he humbly turned his head, his father merely stamped his foot all the harder. Across the room, Despite the chilly weather, Gregor's mother had pulled open a window, leant far out of it and pressed her hands to her face. A strong draught of air flew in from the street towards the stairway. The curtains flew up, the newspapers on the table fluttered and some of them were blown onto the floor. Nothing would stop Gregor's father as he drove him back, making hissing noises at him like a wild man. Gregor had never had any practice in moving backwards and was only able to go at it very slowly. If Gregor had only been allowed to turn round, he would have been back in his room straight away. But he was afraid that if he took the time to do that, his father would become impatient, and there was the threat of a lethal blow to his back or his head from the stick in his father's hand at any moment. Eventually, though, 
Gregor realized that he had no choice, as he saw, to his disgust, that he was quite incapable of going backwards in a straight line. So he began, as quickly as possible, and with frequent anxious glances at his father, to turn himself around. It went very slowly, but perhaps his father was able to see his good intentions as he did nothing to hinder him. In fact, now and then he used the tip of his stick to give directions from a distance as to which way to turn. If only his father would stop that unbearable hissing, it was making Gregor quite confused. When he had nearly finished turning around, still listening to that hissing, he made a mistake and turned himself back a little, the way he had just come. He was pleased when he finally had his head in front of the doorway, but then saw it was too narrow and his body was too broad to get through it without further difficulty. In his present mood, it obviously did not occur to his father to open the other of the double doors so that Gregor would have enough space to go through. He was merely fixed on the idea that Gregor should be got back into his room as quickly as possible. Nor would he ever have allowed Gregor the time to get himself upright as preparation for getting through the doorway. What he did, making more noise than ever, was to drive Gregor forwards all the harder as if there had been nothing in the way. It sounded to Gregor as if there was now more than one father behind him. It was not a pleasant experience and Gregor pushed himself into the doorway without regard for what might happen. One side of his body lifted itself. He lay at an angle in the doorway. One flank scraped on the white door and was painfully injured, leaving vile brown flecks on it. Soon he was stuck fast and would not have been able to move at all by himself. Little legs along one side hung quivering in the air, while those on the right side were pressed painfully against the ground. Then his father gave him a hefty shove from behind, which released him from where he was held and sent him flying and, heavily bleeding, deep into his room. The door was slammed shut with the stick, and then, finally, all was quiet. Not until it was twilight did Gregor awake out of a deep sleep, more like a swoon than a sleep. He would certainly have wakened up on his own accord not much later, for he felt himself sufficiently rested and well slept, but it seemed to him as if a fleeting step and a cautious shutting of the door leading into the hall had aroused him. The electric lights in the streets cast a pale sheen here and there on the ceiling and the upper surfaces of the furniture, but down below, where he lay, it was dark. Slowly, awkwardly trying out his feelers, which he now first learned to appreciate, he pushed his way through the door to see what had been happening there. His left side felt like one single long, unpleasantly tense scar, and he had actually to limp on his two rows of legs. One little leg, moreover, had been severely damaged in the course of that morning's events. It was almost a miracle that only one had been damaged, and it trailed uselessly behind him. He had reached the door before he discovered what had really drawn him to it, the smell of food. For there stood a little basin filled with fresh milk in which flowed little spots of white bread. He could almost have laughed with joy since he was now still hungrier than in the morning and he dipped his head almost over the eyes straight into the milk. But soon, in disappointment, he withdrew again. Not only did he find it difficult to feed because of his tender left side, and he could only feed with the palpitating collaboration of his whole body, he did not like the milk either, although milk had been his favorite drink, and that was certainly why his sister had set it there for him. Indeed, it was almost with repulsion that he turned away from the basin and crawled back to the middle of the room. He could see through the crack of the door that the gas was turned on in the living room. But while usually at this time his father made a habit of reading the afternoon newspaper in a loud voice to his mother, and occasionally to his sister as well, not a sound was now to be heard. Well, perhaps his father had recently given up this habit of reading aloud, which his sister had mentioned so often in conversation and in her letters. But there was the same silence all around, although the flat was certainly not empty of occupants. What a quiet life our family has been leading, said Gregor to himself, as he sat there motionless, staring into the darkness, 
he felt a great pride in the fact that he had been able to provide such a life for his parents and sister in such a fine flat. But what if all the quiet, the comfort, the contentment were now to end in horror? To keep himself from being lost in such thoughts, Gregor took refuge in movement and crawled up and down the room. Once during the long evening, one of the side doors was opened a little and quickly shut again. Later, the other side door too. Someone had apparently wanted to come in and then thought better of it. Gregor now stationed himself immediately before the living room door, determined to persuade any hesitating visitor to come in or at least to discover who it might be. But the door was not open again and he waited in vain. In the early morning, when the doors were locked, they had all wanted to come in. Now that he had opened the door, and the other had apparently been opened during the day, no one came in and even the keys were on the other side of the doors. It was late at night before the gas went out in the living room, and Gregor could easily tell that his parents and his sister had all stayed awake until then, for he could clearly hear the three of them stealing away on tiptoe. No one was likely to visit him, not until the morning, that was certain. So he had plenty of time to meditate at his leisure on how he was to arrange his life afresh. But the lofty empty room in which he had to lie flat on the floor filled him with an apprehension he could not account for, since it had been his very own room for the past five years and with a half unconscious action, not without a slight feeling of shame, he scuttled under the sofa, where he felt comfortable at once, although his back was a little cramped and he could not lift his head up and his only regret was that his body was too broad to get the whole of it under the sofa. He stayed there all night, spending the time partly in a light slumber from which his hunger kept waking him up with a start, and partly in worrying and sketching vague hopes which all led to the same conclusion, that he must lie low for the present and, by exercising patience and the utmost consideration, help the family to bear the inconvenience he was bound to cause them in his present condition. Very early in the morning, it was still almost night, Gregor had the chance to test the strength of his new resolutions, for his sister, nearly fully dressed, opened a door from the hall and peered in. She did not see him at once, yet when she caught sight of him under the sofa, well, he had to be somewhere, he couldn't have flown away, could he? She was so startled that without being able to help it, she slammed the door shut again. But as if regarding her behavior, she opened the door again immediately and came in on tiptoe, as if she were visiting an invalid or even a stranger. Gregor had pushed his head forward to the very edge of the sofa and washed her. Would she notice that he had left the milk standing and not for lack of hunger? And would she bring some other kind of food more to his taste? If she did not do it of her own accord, he would rather starve than draw her attention to the fact. Although he felt a wild impulse to dart out from under the sofa, throw himself at her feet and beg her for something to eat. But his sister at once noticed, with surprise, that the basin was still full except for a little milk that had been spilled all around it. She lifted it immediately, not with her bare hands, true, but with a cloth, and carried it away. Gregor was wildly curious to know what she would bring instead, and made various speculations about it. Yet what she actually did next, in the goodness of her heart, he could not have guessed at. To find out what he liked, she brought him a whole selection of food, all set out on an old newspaper. There were old, half-decayed vegetables, bones from last night's supper covered with a white sauce that had thickened, some raisins and almonds, a piece of cheese that Gregor would have called uneatable two days ago, a dry roll of bread, a buttered roll, and a roll both buttered and salted. Besides all that, she set down again the same basin into which she had poured some water, and which was apparently to be reserved for his exclusive use. And, with fine tact, Knowing that Gregor would not eat in her presence, she withdrew quickly and even turned the key to let him understand that he could take his ease as much as he liked. Gregor's legs all whisked towards the food. His wounds must have healed completely, moreover, for he felt no disability, which amazed him and made him reflect how more than a month ago he had cut one finger a little with a knife and had still suffered pain from the wound only the day before yesterday. Am I less sensitive now? He thought and sucked greedily at the cheese, which above all the other edibles attracted him at once and strongly. One after another, and with tears of satisfaction in his eyes, he quickly devoured the cheese, the vegetables, and the sauce. The fresh food, on the other hand, had no charms for him. He could not even stand the smell of it, and actually dragged away to some little distance the things he could eat. 
He had long finished his meal and was only lying lazily on the same spot when his sister turned the key slowly as a sign for him to retreat. That roused him at once, although he was nearly asleep, as he hurried toward the sofa again. But it took considerable self-control for him to stay under the sofa. Even for the short time his sister was in her room, since the large meal had swollen his body somewhat and he was so cramped that he could hardly breathe. Slight attacks of breathlessness afflicted him and his eyes were starting a little out of his head as he watched his unsuspecting sister sweeping together with a broom not only the remains of what he had eaten but even the things which he had not touched, as if they were now of no use to anyone, and hastily shoveling them all into a bucket, which she covered with a wooden lid and carried away. Hardly had she turned her back when Gregor came from under the sofa and stretched and pulled himself out. In this manner, Gregor was fed. Once in the early morning, while his parents and the servant girl were still asleep, and a second time when they had all had their midday dinner, for then his parents took a short nap and the servant girl could be sent out on some errand or other by his sister. Not that they would have wanted him to starve, of course, but perhaps they could not have borne to know more about his feeding than from hearsay. Perhaps, too, his sister wanted to spare them such little anxieties wherever possible, since they had quite enough to bear as it was. Under what pretext the doctor and the locksmith had been gotten rid of on the first morning, Gregor could not discover. For since what he said was not understood by others, it never struck any of them, not even his sister, that he could understand what they said. And so, whenever his sister came into his room, he had to content himself with only hearing her utter only a sigh now and then, and on occasion appeal to the saints. Later on, when she had got a little used to the situation, of course she could never get completely used to it, she sometimes threw out a remark which was kindly meant, or could be so interpreted. Well, he liked his dinner today, she would say when Gregor had made a good clearance of his food, and when he had not eaten, which gradually happened more and more often, she would say almost sadly, everything's been left standing again. But although Gregor could get no news directly, he overheard a lot from the neighboring rooms, and as soon as voices were audible, he would run to the door of the room concerned and press his whole body against it. In the first few days especially, there was no conversation that did not refer to him somehow, even if only indirectly. For two whole days, there were family consultations at every mealtime about what should be done. But also, between meals, the same subject was discussed for there was always at least two members of the family at home, since no one wanted to be alone in the flat and to leave it quite empty was unthinkable. And on the very first of these days, the household cook, it was not quite clear what and how much she knew of the situation, went down on her knees to his mother and begged leave to go. And when she departed, a quarter of an hour later, gave thanks for her dismissal with tears in her eyes as if for the greatest benefit that could have been conferred on her, and, without any prompting, swore a solemn oath that she would never say a single word to anyone about what had happened. Now Gregor's sister had to cook too, helping her mother. True, the cooking did not amount to much, for they scarcely ate anything. Gregor was always hearing one of the family vainly urging another to eat and getting no answer but, thanks, I've had all I want, or something similar. Perhaps they drank nothing either. Time and again, his sister kept asking his father if he wouldn't like some beer and offered kindly to go fetch it herself, and when he made no answer, suggested that she could ask the concierge to fetch it, so that he could feel no sense of obligation. But then around, no, came from his father and no more was said about it. In the course of that very first day, Gregor's father explained the family's financial position and prospects to both his mother and his sister. Now and then, he rose from the table to get some voucher or memorandum out of the small safe he had rescued from the collapse of his business five years earlier. One could hear him opening the complicated lock and rustling papers out and shutting it again. This statement made by his father was the first cheerful information Gregor had heard since his imprisonment. He had been of the opinion that nothing at all was left over from his father's business. At least his father never said anything to the contrary, and, of course, he had not asked him directly. At the time, Gregor's sole desire was to do his utmost to help the family to forget as soon as possible the catastrophe which had overwhelmed the business and thrown them all into a state of complete despair. And so he had set to work with unusual ardor and almost overnight had become a commercial traveler instead of a little clerk with, of course, much greater chances of earning money. And his success was immediately translated into good round coin which he could lay on the table for his amazed and happy family. These had been fine times. 
and they had never resurrected. At least now with the same sense of glory. Although later on Gregor had earned so much money that he was able to meet the expenses of the whole household and did so. They had simply got used to it, both the family and Gregor. The money was gratefully accepted and gladly given, but there was no special uprush of warm feeling. With his sister alone, he had remained intimate. It was a secret plan of his that she, who loved music, unlike himself, and could play movingly on the violin, should be sent next year to study at the conservatorium, despite the great expense that that would entail, which must be made up in some other way. During his brief visits home, the conservatorium was often mentioned in the talks he had with his sister, but always merely as a beautiful dream which could never come true, and his parents discouraged even these innocent references to it. Yet Gregor had made up his mind firmly about it and meant to announce the fact with due solemnity on Christmas Day. Such were the thoughts, completely futile in his present condition, that went through his head as he stood clinging upright to the door and listening. Sometimes, out of sheer weariness, he had to give up listening and let his head fall negligently against the door, but he always had to pull himself together again at once, for even the slight sound his head made was audible next door and brought all conversation to a stop. What can he be doing now? His father would say after a while, obviously turning towards the door, and only then would the interrupted conversation gradually be set going again. Gregor was now informed, as amply as he could wish, for his father tended to repeat himself in his explanations, partly because it was a long time since he had handled such matters, and partly because his mother could not always grasp things at once. That a certain amount of investment, a very small amount, it was true, had survived the wreck of their fortunes, that had even increased a little, because the dividends had not been touched meanwhile. And besides that, the money Gregor brought home every month, he had kept only a few dollars for himself, had never been quite used up and now amounted to a small capital sum. Behind the door, Gregor nodded his head eagerly, rejoiced at this evidence of unexpected thrift and foresight. True, he could really have paid off some of his father's debts to the chief with this extra money, and so brought much nearer the day on which he could finally quit his job, but doubtless it was better the way his father had arranged it. Yet this capital was by no means sufficient to let the family live on the interest of it. For one year, perhaps, or at most two, they could live on the principal. That was all was simply a sum that ought not to be touched and should be kept for a rainy day. The money for living expenses would have to be earned. Now his father was still hale enough, but an old man, and he had done no work for the past five years and could not be expected to do much. During these five years, the first years of leisure and his laborings through an unsuccessful life, he had grown rather fat and become sluggish. And Gregor's old mother. How was she to earn a living with her asthma, which troubled her even as she walked through the flats and kept her lying on a sofa every other day, panting for breath beside an open window? And was his sister to earn her bread? She who was still a child of 17 and whose life hitherto had been so pleasant, consisting as it did in dressing herself nicely, sleeping long, helping in the housekeeping, going out to a few modest entertainments, and above all, playing the violin. At first, whenever the need for earning money was mentioned, Gregor let go his hold on the door and threw himself down on a cool leather sofa beside it. He felt so hot with shame and grief. Often, he just lay there the long nights through without sleeping at all, scrabbling for hours on the ladder. Or, he nerved himself to the great effort of pushing an armchair to the window, then crawled up over the windowsill and braced against the chair, leaned against the window panes. Obviously, in some recollection of the sense of freedom that looking out of the window always used to give him. For in reality, day by day, things that were even a little way off were growing dimmer to his sight. The hospital across the street, which used to extricate for being all too often before his eyes, was now quite beyond his range of vision, and if he had not known that he lived on Charlotte Street, a quiet street but still a city street, he might have believed that his window gave on a desert waste where grey sky and grey land blended indistinguishably into each other. His quick-witted sister only needed to observe twice that the armchair stood by the window. After that, whenever she had tidied the room, she always pushed the chair back to the same place at the window and even left the inner casement open. If he could have spoken to her and thanked her for all she had to do for him, he could have borne her ministrations better. As it was, they oppressed him. She certainly tried to make as light as possible of whatever was disagreeable in her task. And as time went on, she succeeded, of course, more and more. But time brought more enlightenment to Gregor too. The very way she came in distressed him, 
Hardly was she in the room when she rushed to the window, without even taking the time to shut the door, carefully as she was usually to do to shield the sight of Gregor's room from the others, and, as if she were almost suffocating, tore the casement open with hasty fingers, standing then in the open draught for a while, even in the bitterest cold, and drawing deep breaths. This noisy scurry of hers upset Gregor twice a day. He would crouch trembling under the sofa all the time, knowing quite well that she would certainly have spared him such a disturbance had she found it all possible to stay in his presence without opening the window. On one occasion, about a month after Gregor's metamorphosis, when there was surely no reason for her to be still startled at his appearance, she came in a little earlier than usual and found him gazing out of the window, quite motionless and thus well placed to look like a bogey. Gregor would not have been surprised had she not come in at all, for she would not immediately open a window while he was there, but not only did she retreat, she jumped back as if in alarm and banged the door shut. A stranger might well have thought that he had been lying in wait for her there, meaning to bite her. Of course, he hid himself under the sofa at once, but he had to wait until midday before she came again, and she seemed more ill at ease than usual. This made him realize how repulsive the sight of him still was to her, and that it was bound to go on being repulsive, and what an effort it must cost her not to run away even from the sight of the small portion of his body that stuck out from under the sofa. In order to spare her that, therefore, one day he carried a sheet on his back to the sofa. It cost him four hours labor, and arranged it in such a way as to hide himself completely so that even if she were to bend down, she could not see him. Had she considered the sheet unnecessary, she would certainly have stripped it off the sofa again, for it was clear enough that his curtaining and confining of himself was not likely to conduce to Gregor's comfort, but she left it where it was, and Gregor even fancied that he caught a thankful glance from her eye when he lifted the sheet carefully, a very little with his head, to see how she was taking the new arrangement. For the first fortnight, his parents could not bring themselves to the point of entering the room, and he often heard them expressing their appreciation of his sister's activities, whereas formerly they had frequently scolded her for being, as they thought, a somewhat useless daughter. But now, both of them often waited outside the door, his father and his mother, while his sister tidied the room, and as soon as she came out, she had to tell them exactly how things were in the room, what Gregor had eaten, how he had conducted himself this time, and whether there was not perhaps some slight improvement in his condition. His mother, moreover, began relatively soon to want to see him, but his father and sister dissuaded her at first with arguments which Gregor listened to very attentively and altogether approved. Later, however, she had to be held back by main force, and when she cried out, Do let me into Gregor, he is my unfortunate son. Cannot you understand that I must go to him? Gregor thought that it might be well to have her come in, not every day, of course, but perhaps once a week. She understood things, after all, much better than a sister, who was only a child despite the efforts she was making, and had perhaps taken on so difficult a task merely out of childish thoughtlessness. Gregor's desire to see his mother was soon fulfilled. During the daytime, he did not want to show himself at the window, out of consideration for his parents, but he could not crawl very far around the few square yards of floor space he had, nor could he bear lying quietly at rest all during the night, while he was fast losing any interest he had ever taken in food, so that for mere recreation, he had formed the habit of crawling crisscross over the walls and ceiling. He specifically enjoyed hanging suspended from the ceiling. It was much better than lying on the floor. One could breathe more freely, one's body swung and rocked lightly, and in an almost blissful absorption induced by the suspension, he could happen to his own surprise that he let go and fell plump on the floor. Yet now, he had his body much better under control than formerly, and even such a big fall did not do him harm. His sister at once remarked the new distraction Gregor had found for himself. He left traces behind him of sticky stuff on his soles wherever he crawled, and she got the idea in her head of giving him as wide a field as possible to crawl in and out by removing pieces of furniture that hindered him, above all the chest of drawers and the writing desk. But that was more than she could manage all by herself. She did not dare ask her father to help her, as for the servant girl, a young creature of 16 who had the courage to stay on after the cook's departure, she could not be asked for help for she had begged as an especial favor that she might keep the kitchen door locked and open it only on a definite summons. So there was nothing left but to apply to the mother at an hour when her father was out. And the old lady did come, with exclamations of joyous eagerness, which, however, died away at the door of Gregor's room. Gregor's sister, of course, went in first, to see that everything was in order before letting his mother enter. 
In great haste, Gregor pulled the sheet lower and rucked it more in folds so that it really looked as if it had been thrown accidentally over the sofa. And this time, he did not peer out from under it. He renounced the pleasure of seeing his mother on this occasion and was only glad that she had come at all. Come in. He's out of sight, said his sister, obviously leading his mother by the hand. Gregor could now hear the two women struggling to shift the heavy old chest from its place, and his sister claiming the greater part of the labor for herself, without listening to the abnomations of her mother, who feared she might overstrain herself. It took a long time. After at least a quarter of an hour's tugging, his mother objected that the chest had better be left where it was, for in the first place it was too heavy and could never be got out before his father came home, and standing in the middle of the room like it was, it would only hamper Gregor's movements, while in the second place, it was not at all certain that removing the furniture would be doing any service to Gregor. She was inclined to think to the contrary. The sight of the naked walls made her own heart heavy, and why shouldn't Gregor have the same feeling, considering that he had been used to his furniture for so long and might well be forlorn without it? And doesn't it look... She concluded in a low voice. In fact, she had been almost whispering all the time as if to avoid letting Gregor, whose exact whereabouts she did not know, hear even more of the tones of her voice, for she was convinced that he could not understand her words. Doesn't it look as if we were showing him, by taking away his furniture, that we have given up hope of his ever getting better and are just leaving him coldly to himself? I think it would be best to keep his room exactly as it's always been, so that when he comes back to us, he will find everything unchanged and be able all the more easily to forget what has happened in between. On hearing these words from his mother, Gregor realized that the lack of all direct human speech for the past two months, together with the monotony of family life, must have confused his mind. Otherwise, he could not account for the fact that he had quite earnestly looked forward to having his room emptied of furnishing. Did he really want his warm room, so comfortably fitted with old family furniture, to be turned into a naked den in which he could certainly be able to crawl unhampered in all directions, but at the price of shedding simultaneously all recollection of his human background? He had indeed been so near to the brink of forgetfulness that only the voice of his mother, which he had not heard for so long, had drawn him back from it. Nothing should be taken out of his room, everything must stay as it was. He could not dispense with the good influence of the furniture on his state of mind. And even if the furniture did hamper him in his senseless crawling round and round, that was no drawback but a great advantage. Unfortunately, his sister was of the contrary opinion. She had grown accustomed, and not without reason, to consider herself an expert in Gregor's affair as against her parents. And so her mother's advice was now enough to make her determined on the removal not only of the chest and the writing desk, which had been the first intention, but of all the furniture except the indispensable sofa. This determination was not, of course, merely the outcome of childish thought and of the self-confidence she had recently developed so unexpectedly and at such a cost. She had in fact perceived that Gregor needed a lot of space to crawl about in, while on the other hand, he never used the furniture at all, so far as could be seen. Another factor might have also been the enthusiastic temperament of an adolescent girl, which seeks to indulge itself on every opportunity and which now tempted Grete to exaggerate the horror of her brother's circumstances in order that she might do all the more for him. In a room where Gregor lorded it all alone over empty walls, no one save herself was likely to ever set foot. And so she was not to be moved from her resolve by her mother, who seemed moreover to be ill at ease in Gregor's room and therefore unsure of herself was soon reduced to silence and helped her daughter as best as she could to push the chest outside. Now, Gregor could do without the chest, if needed be, but the writing desk he must retain. As soon as the two women had gotten the chest out of his room, groaning as they pushed it, Gregor stuck his head out from under the sofa to see how he might intervene as kindly and cautiously as possible. But as bad luck would have it, his mother was the first to return, leaving Grete clasping the chest in the room next door where she was trying to shift it all by herself, without of course moving it from the spot. His mother, however, was not accustomed to the sight of him. It might sicken her. And so in alarm, Gregor backed quietly to the other end of the sofa, yet could not prevent the sheet from swaying a little in the front. That was enough to put her on the alert. She paused, stood still for a moment, and then went back to Grete. 
Although Gregor kept reassuring himself that nothing out of the way was happening, that only a few bits of furniture were being changed around, he soon had to admit that all this trotting to and fro of the two women, their little ejaculations, and the scraping of furniture along the floor affected him like a vast disturbance coming from all sides at once. And, however much he tucked his head and legs and cowered to the very floor he was bound to, confess that he would not be able to stand it for long. They were clearing his room out, taking away everything he loved. The chest in which he kept his fret saw and other tools was already dragged off. They were now loosening the writing desk, which had almost sunken into the floor. The desk at which he had done all his homework when he was at the commercial academy, at the grammar school. He had no more time to waste in weighing the good intentions of the two women, whose existence he had by now almost forgotten. For they were so exhausted that they were laboring in silence and nothing could be heard but the heavy scuffling of their feet. And so he rushed out. The women were just leaning against the writing desk in the next room to give themselves a breather. And four times he changed his direction, since he really did not know what to rescue first. Then, on the wall opposite, which was already otherwise cleared, he was struck by the picture of the lady muffled in so much fur and quickly crawled up on it and pressed himself on the glass, which was a good surface to hold on to and comforted his hot belly. This picture, at least, which was entirely hidden beneath him, was going to be removed by nobody. He turned his head towards the door of the living room, so as to observe the woman when they came back. They had not allowed themselves much of a rest and were already coming. Grete had twined her arm around her mother and was almost supporting her. Well, what shall we take now? said Grete, looking around. Her eyes met Gregor's form on the wall. She kept her composure, presumably because of her mother, bent her head down to her mother to keep her from looking up, and said, although in a fluttering, unpremeditated voice, Come, haven't we better go back to the living room for a moment? Her intentions were clear enough to Gregor. She wanted to bestow her mother in safety and then chase him down from the wall. Well, just let her try it. He clung to his picture and would not give up. He would rather fly in Grete's face. But Grete's words had succeeded in disquieting her mother, who took a step to one side, caught sight of the huge brown mass on a flowered wallpaper, and before she was really conscious that what she saw was Gregor, screamed in a loud, hoarse voice, Oh God! Oh God! fell with outspread arms over the sofa, as if giving up the ghost, and did not move. Gregor! cried his sister, shaking her fist and glaring at him. This was the first time she had directly addressed him since his metamorphosis. She ran into the next room for some aromatic essence with which to rouse her mother from her fainting fit. Gregor wanted to help too. There was still time to rescue the picture. But he was stuck so fast to the glass that he had to tear himself loose. He then ran after his sister into the next room as if he could advise her, as he used to, but then had to stand helplessly behind her. She meanwhile searched among various small bottles and when she turned around startled in alarm at the sight of him. One bottle fell to the floor and broke. A splinter of glass cut Gregor's face and some kind of corrosive medicine splashed on him. Without pausing a moment longer, Grete gathered up all the bottles she could carry and ran to her mother with them. She banged the door shut with her foot. Gregor was now cut off from his mother, who was perhaps nearly dying because of him. He dared not to open a door for fear of frightening away his sister, who had to stay with her mother. There was nothing he could do but wait. And harassed by self-reproach and worry, he began now to crawl to and fro over everything. Walls, furniture, and ceiling. And finally, in his despair, when the whole room seemed to be reeling around him, fell down onto the middle of the big table. A little while elapsed. Gregor was still lying there feebly, and all around was quiet. Perhaps that was a good omen. Then the doorbell rang. The servant girl was, of course, locked in her kitchen, and Grete would have to open a door. It was his father. What's been happening? were his first words. Grete's face must have told him everything. Grete answered in a muffled voice, apparently hiding her head on his breast. Mother's been fainting, but she's better now. Gregor's broken loose. Just what I expected, said the father. Just what I've been telling you, but you woman would never listen. It was clear to Gregor that his father had taken the worst interpretation of Grete's all too brief statement and was assuming that Gregor had been guilty of some violent act. Therefore, Gregor must now try to propitiate his father, since he had neither time nor means for an explanation. And so he fled to the door of his own room and crouched against it, to let his father see, as soon as he came in from the hall, that his son had the good intention of getting back into his room immediately, and it was not necessary to drive him there, but that if only the door were opened, he would disappear at once, 
Yet his father was not in the mood to perceive such fine distinctions. Ah, he cried as soon as he appeared, in a tone which sounded at once angry and exultant. Gregor drew his head back from the door and lifted it to look at his father. Truly, this was not the father he had imagined to himself. Admittedly, he had been too absorbed of late in his new recreation of crawling over the ceiling to take the same interest as before in what was happening elsewhere in the flat, and he ought really to be prepared for some changes. And yet... And yet... Could that be his father? The man who used to lie warily sunk in bed whenever Gregor set out on a business journey, who welcomed him back of an evening lying in a long chair in a dressing gown, who could not really rise to his feet but only lifted his arms in greeting, and on the rare occasion when he did go out with his family, on the one or two Sundays a year and on high holidays, walked between Gregor and his mother, who were slow walkers anyhow, even more slowly than they did, muffled in his old great coat, shuffling laboriously forward with the help of his crook-handled stick which he set down most cautiously at every step, and, whenever he wanted to say anything, nearly always came to a full stop and gathered his escort around him. Now, he was standing there in fine shape, dressed in a smart blue uniform with gold buttons, such as bank managers wear. His strong double chin bulged over the stiff high collar of his jacket. From under his bushy eyebrows, his black eyes darted fresh and penetrating glances. His one-time tangled white hair had been combed flat on either side of a shining and carefully exact parting. He pitched his cap, which bore a gold monogram, probably the badge of some bank, in a wide sweep across the whole room onto a sofa, and with the tail ends of his jacket thrown back, his hands in his trouser pockets advanced with a grim visage towards Gregor. Likely enough, he did not himself know what he meant to do. At any rate, he lifted his feet uncommonly high, and Gregor was dumbfounded at the enormous size of his shoe soles. But Gregor could not risk standing up to him. Aware as he had been, from the very first day of his new life, that his father believed only the severest measures suitable for dealing with him. And so he ran before his father, stopping when he stopped and scuttling forward again when his father made any kind of a move. In this way, they circled the room several times without anything decisive happening. Indeed, the whole operation did not even look like a pursuit because it was carried out so slowly. And so Gregor did not leave the floor for he feared that his father might take, as a piece of peculiar wickedness, any excursion of his over the walls or the ceiling. All the same, he could not stay this course for much longer, for while his father took one step, he had to carry out a whole series of movements. He was already beginning to feel breathless, just as in his former life his lungs had not been very dependable. As he was staggering along, trying to concentrate his energy on running, hardly keeping his eyes open, and his dazed state never even thinking of any other escape, then simply going forward, and having almost forgotten that the walls were free to him, which in his room were well provided with finely carved pieces of furniture full of knobs and crevices. Suddenly, something lightly flung landed close behind him and rolled before him. It was an apple. A second apple followed immediately. Gregor came to a stop in alarm. There was no point in running on, for his father was determined to bombard him. He had filled his pockets with fruit from the dish on the sideboard, and was now shying apple after apple without taking particularly good aim for the moment. The small red apples rolled about the floor as if magnetized and cannoned into each other. An apple thrown without much force grazed Gregor's back and glanced off harmlessly, but another following immediately landed right on his back and sank in. Gregor went to drag himself forward, as if the startling, incredible pain could be left behind him but he felt as if nailed to the spot and flattened himself out in a complete arrangement of all his senses. With his last conscious look, he saw the door of his room being torn open and his mother rushing out ahead of his screaming sister in the underbodice. For her daughter had loosened her clothing to let her breathe more freely and recover from her swoon. He saw his mother rushing towards his father, leaving one after another behind her on the floor her loosened petticoats, stumbling over her petticoats straight to his father and embracing him. And complete union with him. But here Gregor's sight began to fail, with her hands clasped around his father's neck as she begged for her son's life.
a serious injury done to Gregor, which disabled him for more than a month. The apple went on sticking in his body as a visible reminder since no one ventured to remove it, seemed to have made even his father recollect that Gregor was a member of the family, despite his present unfortunate and repulsive shape and ought not to be treated as an enemy, that, on the contrary, family duty required the suppression of disgust. An exercise of patience. Nothing but patience. And although his injury had impaired, probably forever, his powers of movement, and for the time being it took him long, long minutes to creep across the room like an old invalid, there was no question now of crawling up the wall, Yet in his own opinion, he was sufficiently compensated for this worsening of his condition by the fact that towards evening, the living room door, which he used to watch intently for an hour or two beforehand, was always thrown open, so that lying in the darkness of his room, invisible to the family, he could see them all at the lamplit table and listen to their talk, by general consent as it were, very different from his earlier eavesdropping. True, their intercourse lacked the lively character of former times, which he had always called to mind with a certain wistfulness in the small hotel bedrooms where he had been wont to throw himself down, tired out on damp bedding. They were now mostly very silent. After supper, his father would fall asleep in his armchair. His mother and his sister would admonish one another to be silent. His mother, bending low over the lamp, stitched at fine sewing from an underwear firm. His sister, who had taken a job as a salesgirl, was learning shorthand and French in the evenings on the chance of bettering herself. Sometimes, his father woke up, and as if quite unaware that he had been sleeping, said to his mother, What a lot of suing you're doing today. And at once, fell asleep again, while the two women exchanged a tired smile. With a kind of mullishness, his father persisted in keeping his uniform on even in the house. His dressing gown hung uselessly on its peg, and he slept fully dressed where he sat, as if he were ready for service at any moment, and even here, only on the beck and call of a superior. As a result... His uniform, which was not brand new to start with, began to look dirty. Despite all the loving care of the mother and sister to keep it clean, and Gregor often spent whole evenings gazing at the many greasy spots in the garment, gleaming with gold buttons always in a high state of polish, in which the old man sat sleeping in extreme discomfort, and yet quite peacefully. As soon as the clock struck ten, his mother tried to rouse his father with gentle words and to persuade him to get into bed. For sitting there he could not have a proper sleep, and that was what he needed most, since he had to go on duty at 6. But with the mullishness that had obsessed him since he became a bank messenger, he always insisted on staying longer at the table, although he regularly fell asleep again, and in the end only with the greatest trouble could get out of the armchair and into his bed. However insistently Gregor's mother and sister kept urging him with gentle reminders, he would go on slowly shaking his head for a quarter of an hour, keeping his eyes shut and refused to get to his feet. The mother plucked at his sleeve, whispering endearments in his ear. The sister left her lessons to come to her mother's help, but Gregor's father was not to be caught. He would only sink down deeper into his chair. Not until the two women hoisted him up by the armpits did he open his eyes and look at them both, one after the other, usually with the remark, This is life. This is the peace and quiet of my old age and, leaning on the two of them, he would heave himself up with difficulty, as if he were a great burden to himself, suffer them to lead him as far as the door, and then wave them off and go on alone, while the mother abandoned her needlework and the sister her pen in order to run after him and help him further. Who could find time, in this overworked and tired out family, to bother about Gregor more than was absolutely needful? The household was reduced more and more. The servant girl was turned off, a gigantic bony charwoman with white hair flying around her head came in morning and evening to do the rough work. Everything else was done by Gregor's mother, as well as great piles of sewing. Even various family ornaments, which his mother and sister used to wear with pride at parties and celebrations, had to be sold, as Gregor discovered of an evening from hearing them all discuss the prices of pain. But what they lamented most was the fact that they could not leave the flat, which was now much too big for their present circumstances because they could not think of a way to shift Gregor. Yet, Gregor saw well enough that consideration for him was not the main difficulty preventing the removal, for they could have easily shifted him in some suitable box with a few air holes in it. What really kept them from moving into another flat was rather their own complete hopelessness, and the belief that they had been singled out for a misfortune such as had never happened to any of their relations or acquaintances. They fulfilled, the uttermost, all that the world demands of poor people, 
The father fetched breakfast for her small clerk in the bank. The mother devoted her energy to making underwear for strangers. The sister trotted to and fro behind the counter at the behest of customers. But more than that, they had not the strength to do. And the wound in Gregor's back began to nag at him afresh when his mother and sister, after getting his father into bed, came back again, left their work lying, drew close to each other, and sat cheek by cheek when his mother, pointing towards the room, said, Shut that door now, Grete. And he was left again in the darkness. While next door, the woman mingled their tears, or perhaps sat dry-eyed staring at the table. Gregor hardly slept at all, by night or by day. He was often haunted by the idea that next time the door opened, he would take the family's affairs in hand again, just as he used to do. Once more, after this long interval, there appeared in his thoughts the figures of the chief and the chief clerk, the commercial travelers and apprentices, the porter who was so dull-witted, two or three friends in other firms, a chambermaid in one of the rural hotels, a sweet and fleeting memory, cashier in a milliner's shop, whom he had wooed earnestly but too slowly, they all appeared together with strangers or people he had quite forgotten. But instead of helping him and his family, they were one and all unapproachable and he was glad they had vanished. At other times, he would not be in the mood to bother about his family. He was only filled with rage at the way that they neglected him. And although he had no clear idea of what he might care to eat, he would make plans for getting into the larder and take the food that was after all his due, even if he was not hungry. His sister no longer took thought to bring him what might especially please him, but in the morning and at noon, before she went to business, hurriedly pushed into his room with her foot any food that was available, and in the evening cleared it out again with one sweep of the broom, heedless of whether it had been merely tasted or, as most frequently happened, left untouched. The cleaning of his room, which she now did always in the evenings, could not have been done more hastily. Streaks of dirt stretched along the walls. Here and there lay balls of dust and filth. At first, Gregor used to station himself in some particularly filthy corner when his sister arrived in order to reproach her with it, so to speak. But he could have sat there for weeks without getting her to make any improvement. She could see the dust as well as he did, but she had simply made up her mind to leave it alone. And yet, with a touchiness that was new to her, which seemed anyhow to have infected the whole family, she jealously guarded her claim to be the sole caretaker of Gregor's room. Her mother once again subjected his room to a thorough cleaning, which was achieved only by means of several buckets of water. All this dampness, of course, upset Gregor too, and he lay widespread, sulky and motionless on the sofa. But she was well punished for it. Hardly had his sister noticed the changed aspect of his room that evening that she rushed in high dudgeon into the living room and despite the imploringly raised hands of her mother, burst into a storm of weeping while her parents, her father had of course startled out of his chair, looked on at first in hopeless amazement, they too began to go into action, the father approached the mother on his front for not having left the cleaning of Gregor's room to his sister, shrieked at the sister on his left that never again was she allowed to clean Gregor's room, while the mother tried to pull his father into his bedroom since he was beyond himself with agitation. The sister, shaken with sobs, then beat upon the table with her small fist, and Gregor hissed loudly with rage because not one of them thought of shutting the door to spare him such a spectacle and so much noise. Still, even if the sister, exhausted by her daily work, had grown tired of looking after Gregor as she did formerly, there was no need for his mother's intervention or for Gregor's being neglected at all. The charwoman was there. This old widow, whose strong bony frame had enabled her to survive the worst the long life could offer, by no means recoiled from Gregor. Without being in the least curious, she had once by chance opened a door of his room, and at the sight of Gregor, who, taken by surprise, began to rush to and fro, although no one was chasing him, merely stood there with her arms folded. From that time, she never failed to open his door, a little, for a moment, morning and evening, to have a look at him. At first, she even used to call him to her with words which apparently she took to be friendly, such as, Come along then, you old dung beetle! Or, Look at the old dung beetle then! To such allocations, Gregor made no answer, but stayed motionless where he was, as if the door had never been opened. Instead of being allowed to disturb him so senselessly, whenever the whim took her, she could rather have been ordered to clean out his room daily, that charwoman. Once, early in the morning, heavy rain was lashing on the window panes, perhaps a sign that spring was on the way. 
Gregor was so exasperated when she began addressing him again that he ran at her as if to attack her, although slowly and feebly enough. But the charwoman, instead of showing fright, merely lifted high a chair that happened to be beside the door, and as she stood there with her mouth wide open, it was clear that she meant to shut it only when she brought the chair down on Gregor's back. So you're not coming any nearer, she asked, as Gregor turned away again and quietly put the chair back into the corner. Gregor was now eating hardly anything. Only when he happened to pass the food laid out in front of him did he take a bit of something in his mouth as a pastime, kept it there for an hour at a time, and usually spat it out again. At first he thought it was chagrin over the state of his room that prevented him from eating, yet he soon got used to the various changes in his room. It had become a habit of the family to push into his room things there was no room for elsewhere, and there were plenty of these now, since one of the rooms had been let to three lodgers. These serious young men, all three of them with full beards, as Gregor once observed through a crack in a door, had a passion for order, not only in their own room, but since they were now members of the household, in all arrangements, especially in the kitchen. Superfluous, not to say dirty, objects they could not bear. Besides, they had brought with them most of the furnishings they needed. For this reason, many things could be dispensed with that it was no use trying to sell, but that should not be thrown away either. All of them found their way into Gregor's room. The ash can likewise, and a kitchen garbage can. Anything that was not needed for the moment was simply flung into Gregor's room by the charwoman, who did everything in a hurry. Fortunately, Gregor usually saw only the object, whatever it was, and the hand that held it. Perhaps she intended to take the things away again as time and opportunity offered, or collect them until she could throw them all out in a heap. But in fact, they just lay wherever she happened to throw them except when Gregor pushed his way through the junk heap and shifted it somewhat. At first out of necessity, because he had not room enough to travel, but later with increasing enjoyment. Although after such excursions, being sad and weary to death, he would lie motionless for hours. And since the lodgers often ate their supper at home in the common living room, the living room doors stayed shut many an evening. Yet Gregor reconciled himself quite easily to the shutting of the door, for often enough on evenings when it was opened, he had disregarded it entirely and lain in the darkest corner of his room quite unnoticed by the family. But on one occasion, the charwoman left the door open a little and it stayed ajar even when the lodgers came in for supper and the lamp was lit. They set themselves at the top end of the table where formerly Gregor and his father and mother had eaten their meals, unfolded their napkins and took knife and fork in hand. At once his mother appeared in the other doorway with a dish of meat and close behind her, his sister with a dish of potatoes piled high. The food steamed with a thick vapor. The lodgers bent over the food set before them as if to scrutinize it before eating. In fact, the man in the middle, who seemed to pass for an authority with the other two, cut a piece of meat as it lay on the dish, obviously to discover if it were tender or should it be sent back to the kitchen. He showed satisfaction, and Gregor's mother and sister, who had been watching anxiously, breathed freely and began to smile. The family itself took its meals in the kitchen. Nonetheless, Gregor's father came into the living room before going into the kitchen and with one prolonged bow, cap in hand, made a round of the table. The lodgers all stood up and murmured something in their beards. When they were alone again, they ate their food in almost complete silence. It seemed remarkable to Gregor that among the various noises coming from the table, he could always distinguish the sound of their masticating teeth. As if this was a sign to Gregor that one needed teeth in order to eat, and that with toothless jaws, even one of the finest make, one could do nothing. I am hungry enough, said Gregor sadly to himself. But not for that kind of food. How these lodgers are stuffing themselves, and here I am dying of starvation. On that very evening, during the whole of his time there, Gregor could not remember ever having heard a violin, the sound of a violin playing came from the kitchen. The lodgers had already finished their supper, the one in the middle had brought out a newspaper and given the other two a page apiece, and now they were leaning back at ease, reading and smoking. When the violin began to play, they pricked up their ears, got to their feet, and went on tiptoe to the hall door where they stood huddled together. Their movement must have been heard in the kitchen, for Gregor's father called out, Is the violin playing disturbing you, gentlemen? It can be stopped at once. On the contrary, said the middle lodger, could not Fräulein Samsa come and play in this room, beside us, where it is much more convenient and comfortable? Oh, certainly, 
cried Gregor's father as if he were the violin player. The lodgers came back into the living room and waited. Presently, Gregor's father arrived with the music stand, his mother carrying the music, and his sister with the violin. His sister quietly made everything ready to start playing. His parents, who had never let rooms before, and so had an exaggerated idea of the courtesy due to lodgers, did not venture to sit down on their own chairs. His father leaned against the door, the right hand thrust between two buttons on his liberally coat, which was formally buttoned up. But his mother was offered a chair by one of the lodgers and, since she left the chair just where he had happened to put it, sat down in a corner to one side. Gregor's sister began to play. The father and mother, from either side, intently watched the movements of her hands. Gregor, attracted by the playing, ventured to move forward a little until his head was actually inside the living room. He felt hardly any surprise at his growing lack of consideration for others. There had been a time when he prided himself on being considerate. And yet, just on this occasion, he had more reason than ever to hide himself, since owing to the amount of dust which lay thick in his room and rose into the air at the slightest movement, he too was covered with dust, fluff and hair and remnants of food trailed with him, caught on his back and along his sides. His indifference to everything was much too great for him to turn his back and scrape himself clean on the carpet, as he had done several times a day. And in spite of his condition, no shame deterred him from advancing a little over the spotless floor of the living room. To be sure, no one was aware of him. The family was entirely absorbed in the violin playing. The lodgers, however, who first of all had stationed themselves, hands in pockets, much too close behind the music stand so that they could all have read the music, which must have bothered his sister, had soon retreated to the window, half whispering with bent down heads, and stayed there while his father turned an anxious eye on them. Indeed, they were making it more than obvious that they had been disappointed in their expectations of hearing good or enjoyable violin playing, that they had more than enough of the performance and only out of courtesy suffered a continued disturbance of their peace. From the way they all kept blowing the smoke of their cigars high in the air through the nose and mouth, one could divine their irritation. And yet, Gregor's sister was playing so beautifully. Her face leaned sideways. Intently and sadly, her eyes followed the notes of the music. Gregor crawled a little further and lowered his head to the ground so that it might be possible for his eyes to meet hers. Was he an animal when music had such an effect upon him? He felt as if the way were opening before him to the unknown nourishment he craved. He was determined to push forward till he reached his sister, to pull at her skirt and let her know that she was to come into his room with her violin, for no one here appreciated her playing as much as he would appreciate it. He would never let her out of his room, at least not so long as he lived. His frightful appearance would become, for the first time, useful to him. He would watch all the doors of his room at once and spit at intruders. But his sister should need no constraint. She should stay with him of her own free will. She should sit beside him on the sofa, bend down her ear to him, and hear him confide that he had the firm intention of sending her to the conservatorium, and that, but for his mishap, last Christmas. Surely, Christmas was long past. He would have announced it to everybody without allowing a single objection. After this confession, his sister would be so touched that she would burst into tears and Gregor would then raise himself to her shoulder and kiss her on the neck, which, now that she went to business, she kept free of any ribbon or collar. Mr. Samsa, cried the middle lodger to Gregor's father and pointed without wasting any more words at Gregor, now working himself slowly forwards. The violin fell silent. The middle lodger first smiled to his friends with a shake of the head and then looked at Gregor again. Instead of driving Gregor out, his father seemed to think it more needful to begin by soothing down the lodgers, although they were not at all agitated and apparently found Gregor more entertaining than the violin playing. He hurried towards them and, spreading out his arms, tried to urge them back into their own room and at the same time to block their view of Gregor. They now began to be really a little angry. One could not tell whether it was because of the old man's behavior or because it had just dawned on them all, unwittingly, they had such a neighbor as Gregor next door. They demanded explanations of his father. They waved their arms like him, tugged uneasily at their beards and only with reluctance back towards their room. 
Meanwhile, Gregor's sister, who stood there as if lost when her playing was so abruptly broken off, came to life again, pulled herself together all at once after standing for a while holding violin and bow and nervously hanging hands and staring at her music, pushed her violin into the lap of her mother, who was still sitting in her chair fighting asthmatically for breath, and ran into the lodger's room, to which they were now being shepherded by her father rather more quickly than before. One could see the pillows and blankets on the beds flying under her accustomed fingers and being laid in order. Before the lodgers had actually reached the room, she had finished making their beds and slipped out. The old man seemed, once more, to be so possessed by his mullish self-assertiveness that he was forgetting all the respects he should show to his lodgers. He kept driving them on and driving them on until in the very door of the bedroom, the middle lodger stomped his foot loudly on the floor and so brought him to a halt. I beg to announce, said the lodger, lifting one hand and looking also at Gregor's mother and sister, that because of the disgusting conditions prevailing in this household and family, here he spat on the floor with emphatic brevity, I give you notice on the spot. Naturally, I won't pay you a penny, not even for the days I have lived here. On the contrary, I shall consider bringing an action for damages against you, based on claims. Believe me, that will be easily susceptible of proof. He ceased and stared straight in front of him, as if expected something. In fact, his two friends at once rushed into the breach with these words, And we too give notice on the spot. On that, he seized the door handle and shut the door with a slam. Gregor's father, groping with his hands, staggered forward and fell into his chair. It looked as if he were stretching himself there for an ordinary evening nap, but the marked jerkings of his head, which was as if uncontrollable, showed that he was far from sleep. Gregor had simply stayed quietly all the time on the spot where the lodgers had espied him. Disappointment at the failure of his plan, perhaps also the weakness arising from extreme hunger, made it impossible for him to move. He feared, with a fair degree of certainty, that at any moment the general tension would discharge itself in a combined attack upon him, and he lay waiting. He did not react even to the noise made by the violin as it fell off his mother's lap from under her trembling fingers and gave out a resonant note. My dear parents, said his sister, slapping her hand on the table by way of introduction, things can't go on like this. Perhaps you don't realize that, but I do. I won't utter my brother's name in the presence of this creature. And so, all I say is, we must try to get rid of it. We've tried to look after it and to put up with it as far as is humanely possible, and I don't think anyone could reproach us in the slightest. She is more than right, said Gregor's father to himself. His mother, who was still choking for lack of breath, began to cough hollowly into her hand with a wild look in her eyes. His sister rushed over to her and held her forehead. His father thoughts seemed to have lost their vagueness at Grede's words. He sat more upright, fingering his service cap that lay among the plates still lying on the table from the lodger's supper, and from time to time he looked at the still form of Gregor. We must try to get rid of it, his sister now said explicitly to her father, since her mother was coughing too much to hear a word. It will be the death of both of you, I can see that coming. When one has to work as hard as we do, all of us, one can't stand this continual torment at home on top of it. At least I can't stand it any longer. And she burst into such a passion of sobbing that her tears dropped on her mother's face where she wiped them off mechanically. My dear, said the old man sympathetically and with evident understanding, but what can we do? Gregor's sister merely shrugged her shoulders to indicate the feeling of helplessness that had now overmastered her during her weeping fit, in contrast to her former confidence. If he could understand us? said her father, half questioningly. Grede, still sobbing, vehemently waved a hand to show how unthinkable that was. If he could understand us repeated the old man, shutting his eyes to consider his daughter's conviction that understanding was impossible. Then perhaps we might come to some sort of an agreement with him, but as it is... He must go, cried Gregor's sister. There's only one solution, father. You must just try to get rid of the idea that this is Gregor. The fact that we've believed it for so long is the root of all our trouble. 
But how can it be Gregor? If this were Gregor, he would have realized long ago that human beings can't live with such a creature, and he would have gone away of his own accord. Then we wouldn't have any brother, but we'd be able to go on living and keep his memory in honor. As it is, this creature persecutes us, drives away our lodgers, obviously wants the whole apartment to himself, and would have us all sleep in the gutter. Just look, father. She shrieked all at once. He's at it again. And in an access of panic that was quite incomprehensible to Gregor, she quitted her father, literally thrusting the chair from her, as if she would rather sacrifice her mother than stay so near to Gregor, and rushed behind her father, who also rose up, being simply upset by her agitation, and half spread his arms out as if to protect her. Yet Gregor had not the slightest intention of frightening anyone, far less his sister. He had only begun to turn around in order to crawl back to his own room. But it was certainly a startling operation to watch, since because of his disabled condition, he could not execute the difficult turning movements, except by lifting his head and then bracing it against the floor over and over again. He paused and looked round. His good intentions seemed to have been recognized. The alarm had only been momentary. Now they were all watching him in melancholy silence. His mother lay in her chair, her legs stiffly outstretched and pressed together, her eyes almost closing for sheer weariness. His father and his sister were sitting beside each other, his sister's arm around the old man's neck. Perhaps I can go on turning around, thought Gregor, and began his labors again. He could not stop himself from panting with effort, and had to pause now and then to take a breath. Nor did anyone harass him. He was left entirely to himself. When he had completed the turnaround, he began at once to crawl straight back. He was amazed at the distance separating him from his room, and could not understand how, in his weak state, he had managed to accomplish the same journey so recently almost without remarking it. Intent on crawling as fast as possible, he barely noticed that not a single word that an ejaculation from his family interfered with his progress. Only when he was already in the doorway did he turn his head around, not completely, for his neck muscles were getting stiff, but enough to see that nothing had changed behind him except that his sister had risen to her feet. His last glance fell on his mother, who was now quite overcome by sleep. Hardly was he inside of his room when the door was hastily pushed shut, bolted, and locked. The sudden noise in his rear startled him so much that his little legs gave way beneath him. It was his sister who had shown such haste. She had been standing ready waiting and had made a light spring forward. Gregor had not even heard her coming and she cried, At last, to her parents as she turned the key in the lock. And what now? said Gregor to himself, looking around in the darkness. Soon he made the discovery that he was now unable to stir a limb. This did not surprise him, rather it seemed unnatural that he should ever actually have been able to move on these feeble little legs, otherwise he felt relatively comfortable. True, his whole body was aching, but it seemed that the pain was gradually growing less and would finally pass away. The rotting apple in his back and the inflamed path around it, all covered with soft dust, already hardly troubled him. He thought of his family with tenderness and love. The decision that he must disappear was one that he held to even more strongly than his sister, if that were possible. In this state of vacant and peaceful meditation, he remained until the tower clock struck three in the morning. The first broadening of light in the world outside the window entered his consciousness once more. Then his head sank to the floor of its own accord, and from his nostrils came the last faint flicker of his breath. When the charwoman arrived early in the morning, what between her strength and her impatience, she slammed all the doors so loudly, never mind how often she had been begged not to do so, that no one in the whole apartment could enjoy any quiet sleep after her arrival, she noticed nothing unusual as she took her customary peek into Gregor's room. She thought he was lying motionless on purpose, pretending to be in the cell. She credited him with every kind of intelligence. Since she happened to have the long-handled broom in her hand, she tried to tickle him up with it, from the doorway. When that too produced no reaction, she felt provoked and poked at him a little harder, and only when she had pushed him along the floor without meeting any resistance was her attention aroused. It did not take her long to establish the truth of the matter, and her eyes widened. She let out a whistle, yet did not waste much time over it, but tore open the door of the Samsa's bedroom and yelled into the darkness at the top of her voice. Just look at this! It's dead! 
It's lying here, dead and done for. Mr. and Mrs. Samsa started up in a double bed, and before they realized the nature of the charwoman's announcement, had some difficulty in overcoming the shock of it. But then they got out of bed quickly, one on either side, Mr. Samsa throwing a blanket over his shoulders, Miss Samsa in nothing but her nightgown. In this array, they entered Gregor's room. Meanwhile, the door of the living room opened too, where Grede had been sleeping since the advent of the lodgers. She was completely dressed as if she had not been to bed, which seemed to be confirmed also by the paleness of her face. Dead? said Miss Samsa, looking questioningly at the charwoman, although she could have investigated for herself, and the fact was so obvious enough without investigation. I would say so, said the charwoman, proving her words by pushing Gregor's corpse a long way to one side with a broomstick. Mrs. Samsa made a movement as if to stop her, but checked it. Well, said Mr. Samsa, now thanks be to God. He crossed himself, and the free woman followed his example. Grete, whose eyes never left the corpse, said, Just see how thin he was. It's such a long time since he's eaten anything. The food came out again just as it went in. Indeed, Gregor's body was completely flat and dry, as could only now be seen when it was no longer supported by the legs and nothing prevented one from looking closely at it. Come in beside us, Grete, for a little while, said Miss Samsa, with a tremendous smile, and Grete, not without looking back at a corpse, followed her parents into her bedroom. The charwoman shut the door and opened the window wide. Although it was so early in the morning, a certain softness was perceptible in the fresh air. After all, it was already the end of March. The three lodgers emerged from their room and were surprised to see no breakfast. They had been forgotten. Where's our breakfast? said the middle lodger peevishly to the charwoman, but she put her finger on her lips and hastily, without a word, indicated by gestures that they should go into Gregor's room. They did so and stood, their hands in their pockets of their somewhat shabby coats, around Gregor's corpse in a room where it was now fully light. At that, the door of the Samsa's bedroom opened and Mr. Samsa appeared in his uniform, his wife on one arm, his daughter on the other. They all looked a little as if they had been crying. From time to time, Grete hid her face on her father's arm. Leave my house at once, said Mr. Samsa, and pointed to the door without disengaging himself from the woman. What do you mean by that? said the middle lodger, taken somewhat aback, with a feeble smile. The two others put their hands behind them and kept rubbing them together, as if in gleeful expectation of a fine set two in which they were bound to come off the winners. I mean just what I say answered Mr. Samsa, and advanced in a straight line with his two companions towards the lodger. He stood his ground, at first, quietly, looking at the floor as if his thoughts were taking a new pattern in his head. Then let us go by all means, he said, and looked up at Mr. Samsa, as if in a sudden access of humility, he were expressing some renewed sanction for his decision. Mr. Samsa merely nodded briefly, once or twice, with meaning eyes. Upon that, the lodger really did go with long strides into the hall. His two friends had been listening and had quite stopped rubbing their hands for some moment and now went scuttling after him, as if afraid that Mr. Samsa might get into the hall before them and cut them off from their leader. In the hall, they all three took their hats off from the rack, their sticks from the umbrella stand, bowed in silence and quitted the apartment. With a suspiciousness which proved quite unfounded, Mr. Samsa and the two women followed them out to the landing. Leaning over the banisters, they watched the three figures slowly, but surely, going down the long stairs, vanishing from sight at a certain turn of the staircase on every floor and coming into view again after a moment or so. The more they dwindled, the more the Samsa family's interest in them dwindled. And when a butcher's boy met them and passed them on the stairs, coming up proudly with a tray on his head, Mr. Samsa and the two women soon left the landing and, as if a burden had been lifted from them, went back into their apartment. They decided to spend this day in resting and going for a stroll. They had not only deserved such a respite from work, but absolutely needed it. And so, they sat down at the table and wrote three notes of excuses. Mr. Samsa to his board of management, Mrs. Samsa to her employer, and Grete to the head of her firm. While they were writing, the charwoman came in to say that she was going now, since her morning's work was finished. At first, they only nodded without looking up, but as she kept hovering there, they eyed her irritably. Well, said Mr. Samsa, 
The charwoman stood grinning in the doorway as if she had good news to impart to the family, but meant not to say a word unless properly questioned. The small ostrich feather, standing upright on her hat, which had annoyed Mr. Samsa ever since she was engaged, was waving gaily in all directions. Well, what is it then? asked Mrs. Samsa, who obtained more respect from the charwoman than the others. Oh, said the charwoman, giggling so amiably that she could not at once continue. Just this, you don't need to bother about how to get rid of the thing next door. It's been said to already. Miss Samsa and Grete bent over their letters again, as if preoccupied. Mr. Samsa, who perceived that she was eager to begin describing it all in detail, stopped her with a decisive hand. But since she was not allowed to tell her story, she remembered the great hurry she was in, being obviously deeply huffed. Bye, everybody, she said, whirling off violently, and departed with a frightful slamming of doors. She'll be given notice tonight, said Mr. Samsa, but neither from his wife nor from his daughter did he get any answer, for the charwoman seemed to have shattered again the composure they had barely achieved. They rose, went to the window, and stayed there, clasping each other tight. Mr. Samsa turned in his chair to look at them and quietly observed them for a little while. Then he called out, Come along now, do. Let bygones be bygones, and you might have some consideration for me. The two of them complied at once, hastened to him, caressed him, and quickly finished their letter. Then they all three left the apartment together, which was more than they had done for months, and went by tram into the open country outside the town. The tram, in which they were the only passengers, was filled with warm sunshine. Leaning comfortably back in their seats, they canvassed their prospects for the future, and it appeared on closer inspection that these were not all that bad. For the jobs they had got, which so far they had never really discussed with each other, were all three admirable and likely to lead to better things later on. The greatest immediate improvement in their condition would, of course, arise from moving to another house. They wanted to take a smaller and cheaper, but also better situated and more easily run apartment than the one they had, which Gregor had selected. While they were thus conversing, it struck both Mr. and Mrs. Samsa almost at the same moment as they became aware of their daughter's increasing vivacity that in spite of all the sorrow of recent times which had made her cheeks pale, she had bloomed into a pretty girl with a good figure. They grew quieter and half unconsciously exchanged glances of complete agreement, having come to the conclusion that it would soon be time to find a good husband for her. And it was like a confirmation of their new dreams and excellent intentions that at the end of their journey, their daughter sprang to her feet first and stretched her young body. <laughs>